to be at the point of your life where you don't care about being judged. You can be in a room of a million people and they all hate you and you walk in and you go like this. Did, have you just got here? Yes. Yeah. We had some other obligations. Of course, obligations. <laughs> yeah. Do you like doing the interviews still? Or? No. No? <laughs> I, I never did like them. No? No. No. Oh, hopefully this one will be good for you. Oh, they're yeah. all good. For, yeah. you know, people get something out of them, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything you particularly don't want to talk about? No. I am, uh, that's the best thing about me, man. I'm open book. Yeah. Wherever the, the um, podcast goes is yeah. it's good enough for me. We've sold a, a million copies wow. of our book in seven months. Congratulations. Appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. Um, we were number two behind Michelle Obama for 12 weeks. You know, they say all this. Yeah. Um, but the audio book is something that we're pushing hard, especially in the UK, because it's, it's easier. Yeah. And we've sold over 650,000 audio books. Wow. The reason why is because it's the first time anybody's ever done the audio book the way we did it. Yeah, I listened. As soon as it came out, I listened. So, okay. the sort of, so you understand yeah, the, how the we did concept. it. Right. Part, part podcast, part... Part radio yeah. show, part, part reading the whole book. So, yeah. yeah. And um, are, you, are you quite heavily involved with the chap who did it with you? You still, you still work um, with him? Was it just a one-off? It was just a one-off. Yeah. So, you know, trying to find the right ghostwriter is very hard. Yeah. But it's not the ghostwriter. It's you finding your voice. Yeah. So I, I defined my voice. So I actually wrote three of the chapters. Right. So when you give someone the chapters, then they can read it in your voice and say, okay, I get it. Yeah. So it wasn't the ghostwriter's fault to begin with, like the ones I didn't hire. Yeah. It was my fault. Yeah. So. And was there a reason you didn't write it yourself? I was, you know, I'm not a writer. Yeah. Even though I write all my blogs and all my posts and stuff like that, but I want to make sure that it was done. So 99% of it's me. Yeah. I just want to make sure that it was professional. Mm. So you want to put that nice little touch on the end of it. Yeah. So if I'm going to spend this much time putting the product out there, I want to make sure, since I self-published it, I want to make sure that it was done right. Yeah. Would you ever do one yourself, do you think? Yeah, easy. Yeah. Yeah. Even though I'm not a writer, I just have a, a person edit it this time and yeah. I go from there. Yeah. Yeah. I've done, I've written 14 books. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's Roger that. Why I'm interested. Roger that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I, I'm actually, it's kind of like coming it from the other way. I've written all mine and now I'm thinking about getting some help. It's, it's, um, I think it's better that way because you can sit back and just be the mastermind. Yes. You don't have to sit back and say, oh, shit didn't yeah. work. Oh, shit. <laughs> you can sit back and just be a mastermind and right. sit, sit in your bed at nighttime and go, oh, shit. Write it down and say, look, this needs to be in yeah. there. And then you yeah. it worked out well for me. And you've got the accountability, haven't you? Because it is so hard to sit down and keep yourself. That's right. Because yeah. you're, you're, you're doing too many things. Yeah. This way, me and my fiance, we read it over and over again. I mean, we, we changed so many chapters. Yeah. And then we rewrote them and then he helped out. So it, it works a lot better. You'll see, it'll be, it'll be a masterpiece. Yeah. And how did you find him? Honestly, he fell in my lap. He well, fell where's my lap. mine? I've done 15 I books, know. where's mine? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I, I got lucky, man. Someone, someone knew someone that, see, he, he's not even a ghostwriter. He just does, what is he? A, um, he's a journalist. He's a journalist. Yeah. Never asked that ghostwriter. All right. So he heard a bunch of my podcasts, so he's very familiar with me to begin with, which helped. Most of the other people I had to interview, and they're like, oh, and they wrote all these big books. And I'm so raw and real. I needed someone that was able to write raw and real. Yeah. And that's how it came to be. Yeah, because it is very natural. It, it doesn't feel like a very highly edited, scripted no. book. Matter of fact, I think they edited it. When we got it edited, it was by a true editor. Yeah, there was a handful of it. A handful of edit. Like yeah, hardly anything came back. Yeah, because like don't don't change a lot because yeah. this is how I talk. Yeah, you know. Yeah, so. and I always prefer the audio books because like I listen to it and I heard you. I've heard your voice before I meet you. Right. So there's that sort of remote connection there. Whereas if you read the book. I can't hear your voice. I don't know what you sound like. You don't know me. Yeah. Right. You know a fucking book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Great. So, so, we, so is there cussing or not cussing? You can just... say whatever you want, however you want it. So if okay. you want to, if it feels natural, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're good with that, aren't we? Yep. Yeah. We've had a, definitely a few good ones. So. 
David, thank you very much for coming and uh, doing the podcast. I appreciate you having me. And um, you're here to, uh, you're doing a public speech, is that right? Yes, yeah, this is my first time in London, so I'm doing a, a speaking event, about 500 people, so we'll see how that goes tomorrow. Yeah. Is Hopefully that, it goes well. Is that something you've done a lot of? I've done a, a lot of public speaking. Yeah. A lot of public speaking, yes. And something you enjoy doing? I don't enjoy doing it. No. <laughs> No, I'm not. No, because you said you don't enjoy doing no, interviews. No, I, I don't enjoy doing interviews, and people go, well, well why do you do it? Um, one big reason why I can't stand it, public speaking, being on camera, I used to stutter real bad growing up. So you're always having to face these fucking demons that come out of everywhere. You know, yeah. people think, you know, because I'm decently successful now, successful not monetarily, but just I've overcome a lot, and yeah. I have a nice-looking resume. But um, I'm still every day, you know, just battling. So mm. this is why I do it. I do it for my own personal, you know, fears and younger thing about fuck, man. I'd be out here stuttering and shit. So you got, <laughs> you got man up, man. Yeah. It's funny that you're sitting here saying that like things like public speaking you find hard when mm. you've done all the crazy, insane stuff that you've done. Because I do them alone. Right. I do them alone. Yeah. You know, like I, I pick these hard things that... Most people think you can't finish anyway. So, you know, you go out there, you grind, you're alone, you're in your own head. I work best alone. Right. I work best alone. So those are easier. Mm. You know, I uh, figured out a way to kind of challenge, you know, kind of challenge uh, your mind, channel it and challenge it at the same time. And I figured out a way to kind of just become, have an indestructible toolbox mm. in your mind. So those are easier. Yeah. So. And how are you finding now? You're very public. Right. You would say famous. Uh, you come to London, which isn't where you live, and you get recognized everywhere. You're speaking in front of 500 people. How are you finding that phase of challenging your mind and your life? It sucks. <laughs> it sucks. I'm going to be honest with you, man, because, uh, but for some reason, you know, I have, uh, I have a gift. I have a gift. It's not a gift of gab. It's just a gift of saying, look, man, I'm vulnerable. I'm very, very human. I'm not God's gift. I'm not Superman. I'm not Batman. I'm not even Robin. But I did figure out some things along my journey. So if I kept myself introverted and closed in, no one would ever, you know, realize, man, that, that big, hard, tough guy over there, man, you know, he's just some superhuman. And mm. they put a title on me. This way, I had to break myself down, let people know that anyone can be who they want to be. Mm. So I think you're kind of like this paradox because on the one hand, a lot of people are inspired by you. Right. Um, your book was big in the UK as well as America when it came out. I mean, I'm big into audiobooks. I listen to hundreds a year and I listen to yours as soon as it came out and a lot of people were talking about it and they were inspired by it, right. definitely. And they felt like they could be better versions of themselves. But that's on the one extreme. On the other extreme, you do superhuman stuff. Right. You do thousands of press-ups. You run hundreds of miles. Right. So I'm kind of like preparing for this interview. I'm like, <laughs> on the one hand, he's superhuman. On the one hand, everyone can relate to him. Right. So, so do, you, do you see what I understand what I'm trying to say? Oh, yeah, I get yeah. it. It's, uh, it's tough. Yeah. But so I had a starting point. And the starting point was this very scared, immature, fragile kid. But through figuring out this fragile kid, I found out, well, shit, through all this fucking muck and shit, this can come out the other end. Person has 4,030 pull-ups who runs miles and miles and miles at a time. But we all have these abilities, not just to run and do pull-ups, but these abilities that once we go back into our dark holes that a lot of us have, a lot of us come from you know, insecurities, a lot of issues, but we don't want to visit that place. Place is scary. Place is something that we want to forget about. I had the courage, finally, to go back in there and organize that shit. Mm. Get it organized in my mind and figure out, you know, where to start from. Mm. So, but the journey led me to the so-called superhuman stuff that I do now. Yeah. So when you said you had the courage, finally, what does finally mean? I was haunted. So we all have these voices in our head. We like to not listen to them. The one that comforts us and keeps us nice and warm and cuddly and gives us cookies and milk at nighttime and shit. We like that voice. <laughs> that voice, the one we want to always hear, which is why people don't like to listen to me a lot. Some people do, some people don't. 
the only thing that changes you is being real. So basically, you know, I hadn't had the courage to go back in there because nothing was getting done. Mm -hmm. I kept on going to that nice, cuddly voice in my head saying, you know what? You don't need to do this. That, that's too much work, man. You've earned this. Mm -hmm. You deserve this. And that mentality got me to 297 pounds, fat, out of shape. To me, a loser. To me, making $1,000 a month and making a ton of mistakes. Because mistakes happen on the easy side of life. You take the easy road, the easy path, there's a lot of mistakes over there. The hard journey, you don't make too many mistakes over here because it's too hard. You don't want to repeat it. Mm. So it's challenging. And if you, would you say you've built this almost like sadistic quality where you almost enjoy the pain? I don't enjoy it. It's necessary. Yeah. It's necessary. So every morning I wake up, it's not just about working out, but for me, working out has been a very big part of my mental growth. So for me, if I am not challenging myself every day, and I swear to God, people will not believe it. I was over almost 300 pounds twice in my life. A person that does that twice in his life does not enjoy cardiovascular activity, <laughs> yeah. okay? Yeah. So people can put anything they want to in their head. I did realize one thing. The things I don't enjoy that I still do, that's where growth is at. Mm. And that's, for me, the only place growth is at mm. is in that very uncomfortable, you know, in that uncomfortable zone. Yeah. So I have to visit it every single day. Mm. So and when, when you say visit it every day, what sort of things are you doing daily to push yourself? So, for instance, today I woke up and I just got to London and I don't know where to run here. It's very difficult to run around this place. Mm. So someone said, hey, you can run around out here, like around this one mile block. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not doing that. So I went down to the gym and there's this like crazy elliptical trainer, but it's not a normal elliptical trainer. It's one that you like almost self power. It yeah. is very, yeah, it's not electric. You know, yeah, yeah. very difficult. Yeah. So I got on that thing and I realized, man, this shit sucks. <laughs> and after like two minutes, I'm like, I don't want to do this. So right then I realized, hmm, it looks like we're going to be here for a while. Mm. <laughs> so I did that for two hours and 45 minutes. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not saying do that, but that's something I did today. Once my mind said, you know what, let's not do this today. I said, well, since we're, my, my mind went there, I redirected it and said, just for having that weak thought, we're going to be on here for a while. Right. So it does sort of sound like you're punishing part of your mind in a way. Punishment? Maybe not be the right word. Yeah. I want my mind to know who's in charge. So for the better part of 26 years, my mind was in charge of me, yeah. which is why I made all these horrible decisions. Once you take control of your mind, you start making decisions for yourself versus mm. your mind making decisions for you. Right. And do you have any routines or particular habits that help you do that? Because it almost sounds like you've got an unconscious voice right. and then you, the conscious David, comes in and sort of overpowers him almost. Right, we all do. Yeah. We all have that, these, these two voices. For me, my routine is every night I stretch out. And I stretch out for two or three hours every single night without mm. fail. Yeah. And while I'm stretching out, I'm thinking about my plan for the next day. And I'm thinking about all these different obstacles that may come up. So basically, a lot of us aren't prepared for life. We get up willy-nilly and just hope life is going to happen. It is going to happen, but it's going to happen with a prepared mind or an unprepared mind. Most people attack life with an unprepared mind. What I do is I try to account for all things that could happen, might happen, probably will happen, and then the unknowns. So basically, I can't account for everything, but I do know there could be some things that come up in life that you need to be ready for. I know for a fact I'm not going to want to work out tomorrow. Therefore, I'm preparing my mind for that. Mm. I don't want to do that. I know tomorrow will come with some difficult decisions to make. It may come with a, getting a phone call saying someone died. This happened. That happened. I'm always preparing myself, not in a morbid way, but just like, look, man, be ready for life. Mm. Don't let life just start attacking you left and right. Make sure that you start to build a mental armor so then you're ready for life. And yeah. that comes with a very physical way 
in the physical helps out to mental. Mm. And do you think that's a, a lot of that's your background, your training, the hell weeks you've done, you know, all of that? Do you think that's created that discipline in your mind? It helped. But honestly, it was, um, I, I realized at a young age how to change myself was through discipline. And the military didn't teach me that. It was something I realized I had zero discipline, zero self-discipline. And I realized I have to start developing this. And I started really because I was horrible at reading and I was horrible at writing. I have so many learning disabilities, it's not even funny. So I just sit down at the table and spend so much time in this reading and writing and, and learning. And that kind of translated over to my self-discipline with, with uh, working out. Mm. So that's where it started. I started when I was about 16 years old and said, well, I have a fourth grade reading level. You know, let me go ahead now and start really uh, focusing because I'm not going to get in the military because I got to pass the test. Yeah. So that's where it started for me. Mm. I think that's another thing why you've been so popular is because you have these great strengths, but you share what happened with your dad. You share what happened with your reading, your dyslexia. And it's almost like, yeah, I know my strengths but I know my weaknesses and failings and vulnerabilities as well. Right. And you kind of own both. Right. Do you think that's important? Very important. It's more important to, to own your weaknesses. You got to really triple down on those, man. Because why? You want to become a full human being. We like to run away from weaknesses. Like, for instance, if you're good at running, all you want to do is run. Mm. If you're great at reading, you have several books. But we don't do those things that we're not good at. So for me, I realized, shit, man, like I keep on running away from these things I'm not good at. I have to dive into these things. I have mm. to become one with these things. And that's what happened. And so I, I, I own them both. Yeah. And I talk very openly about them both. Mm. Do you ever have a day where you just think, fuck it, I can't be asked to do anything. I'm not going for a run. I'm not stretching. I'm doing nothing. Every day. Yeah. <laughs> so you have the thought, but you don't have the day. Every day. Do you ever let yourself have a day when Never. you just watch Netflix? Never, because Some guess what? Good shit on Netflix. I'm haunted. <laughs> no, I can't do it. I can't do it. There may be some days I get up with poopy pants, and I'm like, you know what, man? Fuck this, man. Like, what am I training for? Yeah. I have no race on the docket. Why am I having this, this such a structured life? Why? And I'm like, you know what? I'm good. Mm. I'm done. I retire every day. Yeah. I'm done with this shit. <laughs> and I sit around, I say, okay. And then this is my thought process. So you want to be normal. So you just want to be like everybody else that roams the world, not knowing the power that's in them. Being fine with being mediocre. You want to go back to who you were, huh, David? And I'm like, fuck that, man. Mm. I and have, you have that conversation with yourself every day. Not every day, yeah. it's those bad days. Yeah, yeah. It's those bad days. I see a whole bunch of people walking around out here we have no idea how talented they truly are. And I'm talking about talent, like some God-given ability. Talent that sometimes you have to hone, and you have to work on, mm. and you have to harness yourself. And they just walk around just on their phones, just clueless to how powerful they are. Mm. So you seem really committed, really focused. You put your mind to something, you achieve it. Um, how does someone who's ordinary uh -huh. or listening or watching, get more committed, achieve more success? The biggest thing you have to do is shut off technology. You have to go dark. What I mean by that is you have to be quiet in your mind. Get away from people. We love being around people. We love talking. We love, we love parties. We love all that shit. It's okay to be alone. It's also okay to be unhappy. It's okay to be unhappy sometimes, man. It's okay to say, you know what, man? I'm, I'm fucked up. So you got to go to the truth first. Who are you? Get, get really accountable and say, okay, who am I? What's the truth about me? Get to that dark place in your mind. Figure out, it may take months, it may take years. Figure out your purpose. Figure out what you want to be in life. And then from there, okay, I have my purpose. It may take a long time. No one knows their purpose because it's too loud. Find your purpose. From there, all right. You got to start planning. People love the planning phase because it's very comfortable. Mm. And then from the planning phase, you got to go to execution. So the execution phase where we all hate because that's where the real work begins. And that's when the failure happens and the failure and the failure. So, but, you know, that's, that, that's kind of how you have to do it. Yeah. So is there any part of, thank you, by the way, mm -hmm. is there any part of what you do in your day that actually just really enjoy? It's not, 
overcoming demons or overcoming voices. You just actually think, <laughs> this just actually makes me happy and I really like it. What's funny about maybe all she's this? she's sitting over there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, 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 my fiance is one of them. But honestly, what's funny about this is people may hear all this and say, God, this guy is such a structured guy, talking about demons, getting over things. That's not like his whole life. It's true, but I'm the most peaceful person on the planet Earth, even with like the conversation. I got to go to the gym. I have to do this. I have to do that. Every day I'm winning. Every day I'm winning the, uh, the other voice in my head. So I'm, I'm very... And I'm, I'm at peace with myself. Mm. The things I do for fun are like me bettering myself. Yeah. I love sports. I love watching sports. But I also love accomplishing and overcoming myself every day. Because every day is a battle. Every day is a battle because your mind wants to choose the path of least resistance. Every day. But you don't become better by, by ever doing that. Mm. You become normal. And I don't want to be normal. Mm. So... It may not be a life for everybody, but I find a lot of peace in not being normal in my life. Mm. So if you could define happiness for you, maybe we, maybe we did there, but if you could define happiness for you, what would that be? It's overcoming yourself yeah. at, at all costs, whatever that takes. Mm. To be at the point of your life where you don't care about being judged. You can be in a room of a million people and they all hate you and you walk in and you go like this. Because not because you're angry at them, because you know yourself, inside and out, and you know that you've put yourself to hell to be where you're at today. Mm. You've walked the walk, you've talked the talk, and you've walked the walk. And that's, to me, what it's all about. Mm. It's all about putting those boots on the ground and getting after it every day. And once you do that, you have a feeling about yourself that no one can ever take away or even understand. Yeah. So your book, Can't Hurt Me, mm -hmm. um, I find the title really, I think it's a great title. And forgive me if I'm being a bit, bit bold here, but I felt like it was a great title because I did feel like you were quite hurt. Oh, yeah. Um, with what happened with your dad, your upbringing. Mm -hmm. I felt like you were hurt. Right. And so there's this paradox of, look, I, you can't hurt me because I've, I, I'm owning my life. Right. But I felt like you were hurt. Oh, yeah. Life beat me the fuck up bad. Mm. It, I mean, I was uh, knocked out in the 12th round of a 15-round, of a you know, heavyweight bout. I was knocked out. But what happened was in the 12th round, when the challenger turned his back on me, I was getting the fuck up. And I got up and won the next three rounds and knocked that motherfucker out in the 15th round. So that's my mind about can't hurt me. I was hurt, man. Like, literally, I had to overcome so much those first 26 years of my life. And I still do every day to day. You know, it's not over. Nah. But the mentality of can't hurt me is just that. No matter what's in front of you, man, you have to face, you have to confront, you have to overcome and move forward. Mm. So my father, you know, some of the kids that bullied me, my learning disabilities, all these things I went through in life, stuttering, you know, has so many different issues, failing and failing and failing, I had to overcome them. Or they would have overcame mm. me. So, so I'm a real believer, sorry to just jump in, but I, I don't want to forget this point. I'm a real believer that who we are and how we're living our life is to a certain degree trying to overcome the voids we had as kids right. and, and how we were 100%. raised. And, and, and like I feel like that story of all the, the, the pain you experience, that is who you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those, those scars are real. Those scars are proof that you know, your past is real. Mm. So they're never going to go away. I, I own them, but I'm, I'm, I'm proud of my childhood. I'm proud because without all of these lessons in life, and everybody says this bullshit. I mean it. Mm. I mean it because I was able to look at my childhood and how I grew up as the ultimate training ground for my life. Someone, there has to be some people in this, on this planet Earth who have my mentality. Mm. As gross as it is to some people, and as far off as it is and not understood, there has to be some people like me on this planet Earth. Has to be some warriors out there that are able to take this mindset and do something with it. So that right there, once you are able to look at your life and realize that all these bad things are actually the ultimate training ground for what you're going to you know, encounter in life, 
Mm. You start looking at your past very differently. Mm. And do you think that's still, that your past still driving you now every day? Not at all. No? Not at all, because that, what I'm doing now, there's not enough fuel in my past. Because you've owned it. I've owned it. You've sorted it out, yeah. It's kind of weird, man. Once you own that, and once you sort it out, that flame goes out. But so does some drive, I guess, because you have That's the right. pain you're trying to get rid of. It's amazing yeah. how powerful anger is. Mm. It is a very, very powerful thing, but it can't overcome everything. No. Were you angry then? I was angry once I was able to uncover the rug yeah. and look at all these different shells that I collected over the years and say, wow, that fucked me up. And that one fucked me up even, even worse than that one. And shit, that one was real bad. And Because what happens is when you start to collect all these shells, and these shells are bad things of your life, and you put them in your nice treasure chest and you hide them, you know, because it reminds you of where you're at, but you don't want to visit them all the time. When I started visiting these shells, I was like, my God, man, this was a, it was a tough, tough way to go. But now looking back on it, man, I don't have any more shells. Mm. So now you have to learn to, now what's your passion? Yeah. So now my passion is still trying to find out what is, what is left, what is more. Mm. Is it, can I be driven without the anger? Mm. And I can be. And what is left and what is more for you? I've only dissected 44 years of my life. While I'm still living, I'm still in my live autopsy. So, you know, right now, until I'm dead, I'm still examining human potential. How far can the mind go? How far can we go as human beings? So that's... You know, I'm the, I call myself the Stephen Hawkins of, of the mind. Mm. You know, he was obsessed with everything he, he ever dove into. You know, the guy couldn't walk or anything, you know, so he was like the mind. That's one thing he didn't want to lose. Mm. And I became obsessed with it because it's the one thing that controlled me. So I became obsessed with this. What is this fucking thing up here that just has me on a, on a tightrope and just walks me into all these horrible decisions I make and makes me feel so pathetic and weak and insignificant and dumb and stupid and, and everything. Mm. I gotta get control of this thing. Mm. But it's amazing that once you get control of that thing, how far you can go. Mm. And what sort of things are you doing to get control of your mind? Is it still these fitness challenges and things or is it? Fitness challenges are part of it, but it's mostly now really, I'm big into visualization and also self-talk. Mm but also like, where do I want to be in life? Where do I see myself? And then I start making these plans and how I'm going to get there. And I don't deviate from that plan. Mm. So that's kind of how I do them now. I mean, it's a lot more to it than that, but it's a lot of quiet time. I shut out a lot of noise. I only have people in my life that, that need to be there. If you don't need to be in my life, I'm not about acquiring more friends. I'm not about noise. I'm about, okay, are you trying to go somewhere? You can, you can jump on board. Mm. If not, I don't want to hear all your problems. Do you have a solution for your problem? That's what I'm all about right now. Mm. So I'm not about whining, bitching, complaining. I'm about, okay, we need to go this way. Mm. So that's you, the biggest thing. You said earlier that, um, and I'm, I might be paraphrasing the words, about you, know, you want to find other crazy people on the planet, You know <laughs> these other really people who want to figure out the mind, people who want to do amazing things. Right. Have you met many people like that? Have you got some people that you look at that and you go, yeah, you'd be an adversary to me. You'd, you know, you'd, you'd bring out the best in me. I, don't, I forget his name and I'm not trying to meet him anytime soon. That's not it. But I'm fascinated with the guy Free Solo. Mm -hmm. I, he's another guy very similar to me even though I'm not climbing rocks like he did, mm. he has a passion to do something and he's in at all costs. And what he was doing, what he did, I'm not so impressed with what he did. I'm impressed with how he shut the whole world out when he was doing it. He didn't care about, to me, this is how I see it. And I, I may be totally off. I'm not trying to speak for him. I don't know him. Mm -hmm. So let me make that clear. Yeah. To be able to pull that off, you have to be willing to accept death. You have to be willing to accept you're not going to see your loved ones anymore. You can't care about your loved ones when you're on that rock. Nothing mattered to him but that rock. Those people fascinate me. Those people who are able to put themselves in a place like that, and very few people understand that. To want something so badly, I'm not saying that, 
Because I don't think he believed that he was going to die. I don't. I believe that he was willing to sacrifice everything to pull that off. Those are the people, and there's very few people like that, mm. who are willing to say, you know what, man? You don't get me because your feet are nice and firm on the ground. That's where you want to put them. But for me, there's more to life than that. And for him, that lasted, I don't know, three, four hours. I'm not sure how long that took him. I don't know. It took him a while. It's over now. He risked everything for just a few hours on a rock. Mm. And I've done that with my own self, with my own personal life, is I've risked so much. But, but what he gained and what I've gained in these three or four hours in these moments are something that people will never, never know because they've never put themselves on the rock for three or four hours mm. and put everything on the rock. And that's something that very few people can understand. So they, they think he's crazy. And those are the people I can't talk to because mm. it's not craziness. He found something like I found something. I found this. I'm exploring this. He was exploring this. He explored it on a rock. Mm. I explored in different, in different venues. Mm. So those are, the, those are the amazing people that's where I find amazing who are willing to say, look, honey, I love you, but you have to understand something. I have to go away for a while here. I may not be with you all the time because it takes 100% focus to pull this off. I need quiet. I need dedication. I need sacrifice from myself. And I need full support. Because it's going to cost everything to do this one thing that takes three or four hours. Mm. That's the dedication I'm looking for. Right. And that's the dedication that does not exist in this world. Mm. Does not. When you say does not, except him and you? No, or, I, 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 it's hard to find. Yeah. So when I say does not, it's like this. I mean, it does. Yeah. It's so rare that you might as well say it doesn't exist. Yeah. I mean, literally, like, especially nowadays. But the fact that it's rare makes it special, doesn't it? Makes it, it? very special. Mm. But what makes it so crazy to me is so many people have that ability. Mm. They haven't taken the time to see what they want in life. Therefore, he's crazy. I'm crazy. They put a title on us. And you know what a title does to people? A title is the greatest separator of all time. It allows you to go away in your comfort zone saying, he's just nuts. Mm. He's special. Special person. That gives you a get out of jail free card. You can go ahead and be normal now because we're special people. Mm. No, we found what we want in life. That's all it is. That's mm. all it is. And very few people, they're all confused. Life's confusing because they make it confusing. Mm. So when you say, I'm fascinated by this bit, you said, you know, the sacrifice, the quiet, the obsessive nature to, to climb the rock or to run as far as you do and the thing that you gained, what was it that you gained in those few hours of doing those amazing feats? What do you gain? So in the first 100 mile race I did, I wasn't prepared for it. And I won't go deep into the story, but I detail it well in the book. Basically, I ran 101 miles in 19 hours and six minutes unprepared. Shit on myself, pissed blood down my leg, had 30 miles to go. Horrible, worst pain in my entire life. In that 19 hours and six minutes, and that's all it was, I lived 100 years. I was able to pack 100 years in 19 hours and six minutes. All the emotions, the highs, the lows, the, the, the trauma, the failure, the success, the victories, everything you can put in a life, I put it in 19 hours and six minutes. And the beauty that comes out the other side of that, what happens in that time frame, when you're at mile 70 and you're all fucked up and your body is destroyed and you have 31 miles to go and you're now have 31 miles to go, you're in the worst shape of your life with 31 miles to go. It's in that 31 miles that I was able to crack open another part of the human mind, a part that very few people are able to examine because why? They're not willing to go there, like back to the rock, I guarantee you, when he was climbing that thing and he had ropes on, he was thinking, shit, man, I can only imagine this is going to be with no ropes at all, making some of these moves that I'm falling with ropes. You have to go to a different focus. The, the focus has to be so heightened that very few people, they even understand that, but they have it in them. 
They have it in them to go there. But you have to go to a place of fear, of suffering, of pain, of doubt. And that's when your mind, if it, if it knows it's not going to quit, it opens up. And once it opens up, that's my 40% rule. Once you can open, open your mind up when it knows it's not going to quit, it finds more. It finds more focus. It finds more power. It finds more drive. And that's what gets you through the 31 miles. That's, that's, that's what gets him so hyper-focused on that one little nodule to put his finger on. And that's what you find in those moments. But without those moments, you don't know what you're capable of because mm. you're living a very uh, structured life mm. without risk. Mm. And do you think it's changed you as a person having opened that part of your mind? Is it like something that you've seen that you can't unsee? Is it addictive? Is it something you want to, a place you want to go back to again? That It's not addictive at all because... Um, you don't want to live there, you know, but it's definitely a place that makes you look at people very differently. Because once you see, it's different if, if I was born with a silver spoon and everything was given to me and life came easy. But knowing where I came from and where I'm at now, just because I was able to crack open a few more doors, that's what's disappointing for me, for other people. You know, so it's not that I want to live there. I know I can go there. Mm. And once again, I know other people can go there. So I guess that's the thing with me is, that, is I know I have the ability now to go to a place that's very, very hyper-focused that I can accomplish some pretty amazing feats. Not because I'm amazing, because I allowed my mind to be open-minded for the possibilities of what can I achieve. Mm. I'll let you have your sip of water. Failure. Um, you must have some pretty strong views on failure. Having anyone who's not read your book, um, it's called, by the way, Can't Hurt Me. If you haven't got it, you should get it. Um, I think I listed it the day it came out. Um, and you talk a lot about it in that book. But do you want to just talk about that briefly here? Your, your thoughts on failure, how to bat battle it, defeat it, accept it. Well, the thing about it is funny, man, all these uh, catchphrases, people always say, you know, failure is a part of life and failure is how you grow. I've said all that stuff before, but it really is a bunch of shit. <laughs> it really is, man. I'm going to be honest with you, man. I'm so tired. Yeah, don't hold back or anything. You no, know, I'm so tired of hearing all these fucking cliche fucking, you know, like goal setting fucking posters and all that shit. Half the people who write that shit aren't even doing the shit they're talking about. Mm. Half the people talk about failure you know, they're fucking millionaires sitting back at some nice house or whatever the fuck they're talking about. So it, it just, it, it, it makes me fucking nuts. The reason why I believe I can talk on failure is because I'm still failing today and I'm failing in a major way and I'm, and I'm living when I'm talking. So many people who talk about all this shit, they're, they're has-beens. They're people who used to do it back in the day and I talk about it. Are you living it today? So for me, failure is... Um, it's something that you should be afraid of. It should be afraid of, but that's why you should go out there and challenge yourself to fail. Because if you're not failing at something, that means you've set your goals to pass, to succeed at everything you do, which means you're not setting your goals high enough. So for me, okay, I'm going to go out and break the Guinness Book of Rules record for pull-ups. Lofty goal which is why I failed it twice before I finally got it. Mm. I knew going into everything I've ever done in my life, Navy SEAL training, three times before I got it. Mm. Everything I've ever done in my life took me three times before I got it. I knew that there was a huge possibility of failure. Mm. But what I gained from failure is this. When you see a movie and you watch a movie about a person who keeps failing, and at the end, they succeed. How do you feel after you watch that movie? Elated. Amazing, yeah. right? Yeah. I become the movie. Mm. I want to feel how I feel watching someone else in the movie. Mm. When I watched Rocky get his ass kicked and I watched all these different things of failure, I was able to put myself there and say, God, man, how much do you feel now that you finally got there? That's what failure has done to me. I've watched so many things and watched someone succeed at the end of it. It's like, God, I want to feel like that. Mm. But failure causes that one feeling. Mm. Without that, 
failure involved, you don't have that feeling. Mm. If you just pass and you succeed and you're great, that feeling, yeah, okay, I'm good. Mm. What takes you years, months, years to accomplish because you just can't get over the hump, but you continue going back to the drawing board. You're looking for those few seconds after you finally figure out the equation, whatever the equation may be, to get you to finally pass, to succeed. Mm. I live for that feeling, mm. but I can't get that feeling without going through, fuck, I failed this equation. I failed this one, I failed this one, I failed this one. Oh, I'm figuring it out. Mm. So you start to feel it before you even pass, before you even get to, to, to the success part, and then once you succeed, the feeling is unbelievable. Mm. And you take that feeling of success through failure and you put it in your cookie jar. And you say, I'll, I'll come back and get you again. I'm going to need you again down the road in my life mm. to so, call on you. So basically then the level of satisfaction in the success is directly linked to the size of the failures. That's the right. bigger the failures, the better the feeling of success. That's right. Does that become addictive? It does. Yeah. It does. It becomes so addictive that you don't mind failing anymore. Because mm. you know now, oh, I just fucking... Next time. I bit off on something real big. <laughs> yeah. Which means the feeling is going to be really big. Yeah. So, yeah, that's what... I mean, it, it takes failure to get the best feeling in the world. Mm. Do you think the biggest battle in all of this is um, blocking out what everyone else thinks about you? Yes. Most of us fail in life because we're afraid of what everyone around you is thinking. Mm. That's a hundred percent truth. So we live by the narrative of other people. When I first called a recruiter to be a Navy SEAL and I was 297 pounds, the first recruiter looked at me and said, you're not going to be able to make this man. So what he was doing was he's projecting his energy on me. He knew he couldn't be a fucking Navy SEAL. So God helped this black guy, because I was only the 36th African-American to make it through in over 70 years. How's this black fat guy going to make it through in my ass? He wasn't even willing to try. So he's projecting it. So a lot of us who are negative people, all we do is project how we feel on other people. So what happens is there's a lot of negative people walking around the planet Earth who are afraid to try. Because everybody, a lot of people are very negative in this world. So we are afraid to fail. Why? I told you, man, shouldn't even try it, dude. Just chill out, relax. Mm. Why are you so crazy? Why are you so obsessed? So all that stuff drives the, the uh, quitting mind, I call it. The mind wants to quit. The mind's tired. The mind's tired. The mind's deserving. The mind thinks it's very deserving. So yes, the, the, the biggest problem in this world is other people, not yourself. It's other people in your head. They mm. are puppet mastering you pretty much on your life. And is that why you're, you've talked a lot in this podcast about getting rid of noise, mm -hmm. quiet, alone? Is, is that part of that equation? It's, it's all a part of it. Yeah. Because I realized once I was talking to myself the right way and all this shit wasn't in my mind, wow. I went from this piece of shit kid who thought he was dumb, not successful, insecure, who stuttered when I first saw somebody, to a person who can now do all these things just because I now control my own mind. Mm. And I don't care. A lot of people say they don't care. A but they do. Of, they care like my, a my, my, my son says I don't care. And every time he says it, I, I don't care, it means he cares. It means he cares. Yeah. When you get to the point where you really fucking don't care. You don't have to say You're it. dangerous. <laughs> you become very, very dangerous. Mm. I'm not saying don't care like, I don't care if I do that. No, when you don't care about other people, and how they view you, mm. about how you walk, how you talk, how you dress, where you want to go with your life. You know, growing up, I didn't want to tell anybody I wanted to be in the military. Because why? Some of my black friends, I was afraid of what they think. Mm. You know, why do you want to join the fucking military, man? Why the fuck you want to do that shit? Mm. I was afraid of what other people thought about me. So now, when I go in the military, I know you want to fucking join the military. Yeah, I ain't tell you because I was afraid of what you thought. Once again, man, you're allowing other people to shackle your mind. Mm. It's, the, it's, the, it's the worst thing in the world. Do you think you could go the other way and maybe become a bit cold if you don't care what anyone thinks? Your fiance, your kids, you know, those, they're not the people around. Do you not care what they think? See, that's the thing about it. You have to have an understanding of what not caring means. 
If your fiance and your kids don't believe in you, you can't care what they think. That means you chose the wrong support staff. There has to be, so that's why a lot of people don't understand one another. Your support staff has to be like, if I want to go out and do whatever it is, my support staff is, you know, my fiance. If she's like, you know what, you know, I don't think that you should be doing that. I have to take it, you know, why? So I can be open-minded. So, so, so why are you saying this? But if she's saying it because of her, you know, that's not, that's not the right thing. Because I need backing to do what I'm going to do. Mm. Open-mindedness. I need support. So, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, you got to be very clear thinking about all that stuff. Mm. Are there not times, though, and it's just a question, mm -hmm. um, if you've got smart people around you and they're giving you good advice and you're not listening to it, can there become a point when you're just so blinkered sometimes that yes. you don't listen to good advice from smart people? You got to make sure they're smart. Mm. And got your best interests at heart, I guess. That's it. Yeah. So that's why, I, like I said before, like, you know, several minutes ago, my circle's very small. I make sure I didn't handpick these people because I'm like, so, so you don't want people in your corner that are like, oh, let me pat you on the back for whatever the fuck you do. I don't want people pat me on the fucking back because I fucking woke up in the morning. No. So you don't want that. Mm. You want people who are honest with you who are going to tell you what the fuck is honest. Mm. Honest and truthful people. So someone who's honest and truthful, who has lived and is accountable for their own personal life, that's who you want in your corner and say, hey, man, you know what? You're pretty fucking dumb for doing this, dude. Like, this is not smart. Or you're being a, you know, you're being a turd today. You're not getting after it. That's who you want in your corner. Mm. So you don't want a lot of people, handpick people to be in their corner who kiss their fucking ass. Mm. You don't want that. No. No. So you're very selective of who I'm those selective. people are. I'm selective. Yeah, but you'll listen to those people, will you? You have to. Yeah. You have to. So one of my, big, one of my best qualities is I'm open-minded to the right people. Mm. But I don't respect a lot of people. Because mm. how am I going to respect you, not you personally, not sure. but anybody, yeah. if you're not fucking grinding every day? Mm. And I don't mean working out, getting to the gym. Really going out there and grinding. So if you don't know how I'm living my life, how am I going to respect you? So you have to be a hard worker, period, dot. You got to work your fucking ass off. That's where I gain respect for you. Mm. So if you're working hard every day, now you have an opinion in my eyes. Mm. But if you're just a guy who talks shit and you live this fucking life of talking shit, come on, dude. Mm. I understand one thing. You're just talking shit. But if I see you every fucking day of your life trying to be better, every day, going through all the wickets to be better. You got my attention. Mm. I respect you now. Mm. So respect is the first thing. Yeah, great. Emotions. Um, you talked about your mind. Mm -hmm. is, is emotion and how you feel, do you see that as the same thing or different? And have you tried to control how you feel, how you react to people, anger, jealousy, hate, you know, whatever, and trying some kind of mastery of that? Do you see that as different to the mind? Jealousy, 100%. You have to, if you're jealous about anything, that is a horrible thing. Um, anger, I've done really well with controlling it nowadays, back in the day when you're insecure. So all this stuff comes from conquering yourself. Mm. Once you feel good about yourself, all the anger, not all of it, you're human. Jealousy, these things start to really go away. Mm. She's like, you know, I'm good. Yeah. I'm well, good. When you're full, you don't need other people to That's fill right. you up because you're full. That's right. I think a lot of people, they like need people's respect. They need people's opinions. They need people's attention. They need people's love because they're empty. That's right. And they're trying to fill themselves up through other people. But no one can be. live to your standard. Exactly. So you're always going to feel empty. That's how I used to be. Mm. So it created me lying. It created me being a dishonest person. Whatever I could do to get it, to get whatever it was. Mm. Um, but back to your question about emotion, I'm a very emotional person. So I'm very passionate because it took a lot for me to be who I am today. Mm. So I'm very emotional. Yeah. But it's just the passion in me about the sacrifice I put into being who I am today. Mm. So. And sometimes that spills over. Sometimes you lose control of it. It's not losing control. I allow it to go. Mm. 
So I got this award for the VFW called the Americanism Award. And I'm speaking in front of like 5,000 veterans. And I get the award and I'm thanking people and I turn back to my mom and I look at her and for 58 seconds just cried because I had a chance at that time to look and see what I've accomplished and where I came from. And I wasn't trying to hold it, but I had to get myself together to give my speech. But it was a very proud moment for me to be able to reflect and say, okay, man, like, you know, you've not like I've earned that right to cry or to be emotional, mm. but it felt good that literally I grinded myself into a fine powder to get where I'm at today. Mm. And it just came out in that way. So, yeah, emotion is a beautiful thing. Mm. You don't want to, if, if you're emotional, that's bad. Yeah. But if you show emotion at the right time, I think that's a, that's a beautiful thing. Mm. So it's still a, a, an essence of controlling it. Yes. Yeah. Because you, have to, you, you want to be in control of your mind. You want to be in control of your mind. Emotional people, they're a wreck. Mm. They control, that emotion controls your, everything you do. Yeah. And what emotional people do is, like for instance, I always say this, they can have a beautiful life. Husband and wife, kids, everything. Everything they want. But it's the one thing that they don't have that makes them emotional. So that emotion makes them focus on what they don't have. Mm. Emotion makes them focus on everything negative. Everything. Pity party. What was me? This didn't happen. So your mind loves that. It loves talking to other people. Oh, this is all fucked up, man. You know, think about it. People love to bitch and complain about everything. So when you're sitting there, you may spend weeks, months, years bitching about the same thing. So what have you done? Nothing. Mm. There's no solution in that. Yeah. But most of us live there. Mm. Oh, this other guy got the pay raise. The other guy got this. The other guy got that. And we live in this emotional state of, what was me? Mm. Nothing gets accomplished. Mm. Mm. Nothing gets accomplished. Yeah. So, um, penultimate question, then we do a few quick fire, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. So we've just got a few minutes left. Just in advance, say thank you. Mm -hmm. um, business. So um, our business is one of my big passions. I love business. Um, and obviously you've commercialized very well, mm -hmm. doing a lot of podcasts, your book, and of course you're speaking. So um, I don't really want to sort of go into a question per se, right. other than can you just talk about your business interests? How have you managed to sort of pivot your mind from what everyone knows you for mm -hmm. to having a business mind and picking the right gigs, speaking gigs, and what's your speaking fee and going on promoting your book and all that kind of stuff, because that must be a different world for you. Right. People aren't going to like to hear what I got to say. I don't care. I want to hear it. I'm not about money. Not about money at all. It comes. You have to first be authentic. What is your fucking brand? There's a bunch of people who are doing business right now who don't know what the fucking brand is. They're trying to figure it out. They're trying to piggyback off someone else. Let me take this and steal this. Everything I say and everything I do is authentic to me. Mm. And I'm not out here trying to make money off of you. Mm. I'm out here trying to help you. Mm. When you truly want to help somebody out, that's when you have a business. Mm. Your business is when you truly are looking to help have a good product. The product right now is myself. Like basically, are you living what you talk? Are you being who you are? So therefore, people say, hey, David Goggins, I may not like him, but every fucking day I know this guy. Every day I wake up, I know he's out there doing something. I know he's getting out there. I know when, it, when, when he talks, He's speaking truth, whether it be whatever. So what I've done with my business is I made it very true to who I am as a person. I'm not someone else. I'm not trying to fake something. And I'm not looking for your fucking money. I'm here to help you. And when people see that you're here to help you, that's when you can form a business. But people can see right through bullshit. Mm. They can see right through bullshit. So once they see through bullshit, your business is done. Mm. You're not authentic anymore. You're just a piece of shit. Mm. So people see true. So sometimes in your business, you may not make a dime for a while. You have to gain trust of people. You have to have a good product. It has to be about the people, for the people, and not about you. There can't be any underlining things. With Very few people can do that nowadays. 
people, a lot of people nowadays are slugs. They're cockroaches. They're bottom feeders. They just are. They want that quick dollar. It's about me. It's about me, about me, about me. If that's your fucking mindset, your business is done. Some mm. people make it, but they don't last real long. Mm. They don't last long. So for me, I come from hell. I had to persevere through a lot. I got judged growing up. So all I want to truly do for people is I'm for the fucking underdog. Mm. I'm truly, I want to see you fucking crush every motherfucker on the planet Earth. Anybody that says you can't, you can't, you can't, no. With you, you might be your biggest bully. You might be telling yourself you can't. That's my business. Mm. Whether it makes money or not, give a fuck. Mm. That's what it's all about, man. Mm. I want to see you at the end of the day say, look, man, hey, Goggins. When I'm walking through the airport, hey, man, you fucking saved my life. Now I tell everybody to go fuck themselves, man, because I changed my whole life around. That's the business. Mm. If you can do that, you're rich as shit. Mm. that'd be a perfect way to finish the podcast by the way but I've got a couple more questions thank you mm -hmm. um, these are quick fires I mean you can take as long as you like but we sort of do them you know nice cool. and quick um, so best advice you ever received can you remember what it was best advice I ever received was um, it wasn't really advice my grandfather when I was growing up I was being bullied and all kind of shit my grandfather looked at me and he said, you know what, man, you're not going to mount to shit because of how you hang your head. That's all he said. Mm. And as true and as real as it was, it hurt. And a lot of us, what we do is we hide from the truth. We don't want to tell people the truth. We see people every day, loved ones, friends, family members. We see them walking around. Everybody has seen them. And they're not amounting to shit. They're fucking gaining weight. They're not going to school. But we live in a kinder, gentler world. So we don't say shit to them. We just watch them fail because why? We don't know what to say or how to say it. Or we may lose them as friends or they may not love us anymore. You're watching someone fail. The best thing you may ever do for someone is say, hey, guess what, brother? You're a piece of shit right now. You may not say it just that way, but that's what you may want to say to somebody. Look, man, I love you to death, brother but your life sucks. Mm. You're not, you, you are so much better than this, man. You are so much better. I'm, I'm watching you fail and I can't do it. So the best advice I ever got was a negative comment from my grandfather mm. saying, hey, you ain't gonna amount to shit. Yeah. And he didn't mean it in like a mean way. He meant it as honestly. Mm. You're allowing this world to kick your fucking ass and it's going to if you keep on letting it do it. Mm. And it stuck with me. It stuck with me for a long time. Mm. It takes me today. Mm. What's the worst advice you ever received? Which, is, by the way, is a terrible question, I know. No. It normally comes out with good answers. No, so, it's yeah. a fucking great question. The worst advice I ever received was from an agent. And he said, if you publish your, self-publish your book, you will sell 5,000 copies. If you do this on your own, you won't, it, no one will buy this book. I sold a million fucking copies in seven months. So if I would took his advice... We all know how that would have ended up. Yeah. A lot of people would have been happy and I've been upset. Mm. So some advice that you get, the bad advice that you get from people, a lot of times it's the best advice for them. Yeah. Most people give you advice that works for them, mm. especially in business. So make sure, once again, it's by having that good, solid core of people around you yeah. that truly care about what is best for you, mm. not what's best for them. Yeah. Let's talk about the book for a minute then, um, because it did really well. Um, why did it do so well? You know, did you promote it a lot? Did you jump on a lot of podcasts and share it? Was it just the message? Did it go viral? Why do you think it did so well? It did well because I, I was known as this superhuman guy. And I went on these podcasts and I was vulnerable. I told the truth. And the truth is the start line of your life. I went on and told the truth about my life, about, look, man, I'm sorry for letting you guys down, man, but I'm not who you think I am. All these accomplishments, yes, but this is where I come from. And when you're able to be vulnerable and be a tough guy at the same time, it almost people are looking for permission nowadays. And not saying that I'm the permission holder, but like for a guy like me to come out, I'll, after all the tough stuff I've done, I'm known as the world's toughest man. Yeah, uh, That's just a title someone gave me. Mm. But when you're known as that, you do all these tough things, and you're like, hey, man, but check it out, dude. 
you, you open the door for people. In my life, not only was I not the smartest kid, learned disabilities, abusive father, my stepfather, my soon stepfather got murdered, stuttering, obese, the list goes on and on and on. I broke down color barriers. So one time when I went to do my book, I actually went to book auction years ago. They looked at me and was like, hey man, it's only like 15% of America's black. Okay, what the fuck you saying? They thought that only black people would buy my book. I have like, out of the million people that buy my book, is most of them are white. And the thing I say that for is this story, I'm not the hero in this story, you are. I'm basically talking to you to make you think about your life. And I'm being vulnerable to make you think about when you listen to a podcast or you listen to an audio book or you read a book, you're by yourself. Most of us can't be vulnerable in a room of people, but we're very vulnerable alone. Mm. So I'm able to talk to you as one person, even though a million people are reading the book, it's made for each individual because that story I tell is touching someone's life to say, oh man, yeah, I experienced that. Mm. Shit, but how did you overcome it? I never even talked about that shit. Yeah. So I broke down my barriers and that's why, and I, and I did it on podcasts. And I did it and I'm giving you tools, tools to help you get through some of this shit. Mm. Not like five step bullshit, no. I went to the dungeon and I was the guinea pig and I figured this shit out and I'm writing about it. I didn't sit back in a nice comfortable room and say, huh, this would be a good fucking book. Let me say, okay, the five steps of this, and they write a book about it. No, I was the person, I did the research. Mm. You know, I wasn't a theorist, I was the practitioner. Yeah. And people see that. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, is there one thing maybe in the world that you think is really wrong that you'd like to change? Yes, what's really wrong is the softness of this world. Um, everybody's not a winner. Um, there is failure. There is tons of defeat. We have to get that back. That's, that, that's growth. That, that is growth. We have to, everything, everybody has, I'm, I'm, I'm glad everybody has a voice. There has to be structure in the world again. There has to be accountability. Everybody's not right. Mm. Everybody's not right. Kids are kids, you know, and, and it kind of stems from there. People have to get a little bit of toughness back a lot of toughness back because the backbone of, of this world is built off of toughness. Not like I got to go out there and do push-ups and pull-ups and shit like that. It's not about that. Toughness is accountability. You're not always right. There's so many things I can say about this. The world has gotten very, very soft. Any particular areas? Um, and all of us, mm. all of us. It's easy nowadays. We have, we're so, like, like technology is so fast. You know, no one's even going to the library. Why? Google the shit. Mm. Everything's easy. No one's ever cold anymore. No one's ever hot anymore. Everything is exactly the way we want it. Everything is exactly when we want it, when we want it. We are, and, and that's how the world is. Everything is at our fingertips. And that causes you not to use the most powerful weapon in the world, which is your mind. Mm. Everything is easy. So why, so, so when things get hard, how the, how the hell can you rely on your brain when you don't know how to because everything's so easy? Yeah. So we're not utilizing enough mm. because everything is just there. Yeah. So that, so our brain starts to fail. I sense that in my mind a lot. You get comfortable with things. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you know, it's like you have three degrees too cold and you It's true. Yeah, you feel w wet and wimpy. And, it's true. Yeah. I mean, like, it's, it's sprinkling outside. Everybody's running inside. Yeah. It's, 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 it's just these small things mm. versus saying, you know what? And it creeps up on you. You it don't does. really know it's happening. It does. Versus yeah. saying, you know what? I'm a man. Yeah. And a lot of people, like, for instance, I see men and women now are almost all the same. I see women carrying bags. I see women opening their own doors. Like, this whole world is kind of mished into one big, one big person. Mm. All these customs and courtesies, all these things are just gone. Like, you know, the second the, uh, that bell rings when the daggone airplane parks, everybody's just up versus a man seeing a woman that he sent by say, hey, ma'am, is this your bag? Mm. 
It's all these small things. It's all these small self-disciplines. We're always rushing. Aren't we're we? rushing. rushing everywhere. We're yeah. rushing. People aren't holding doors. Or it's all these small things, these small disciplines. Why do you make your bed in the morning time? Mm. When I was in the military, I never forgot. I was like, why the fuck are we folding our shirt up this way? Why? Why am I making these hospital corners 45 degrees and then folding my bed back six inches the size of a dollar? Mm. Why am I doing this? All these small things that we do in life are building your mind up for discipline. Mm. And all those disciplines are gone. Mm. So that's the one thing that we're definitely missing yeah. is self-discipline. And do you think your story and the product of you and your books, the podcast, your message, do you think that is maybe pushing back a bit on that? It's pushing back a ton on it because mm. everything about it is accountability. Everything about it is self-discipline. Everything about it is no one's gonna save you. No one's gonna come out of the woods and say, hey, I got your back, man. I want to take you from all this shit. Some people get that, but very few of us do. Mm. So the only person coming to save you is yourself. And that's what the book's about, man. Don't look around the corner hoping, I want to sit on this couch and hope for a fucking miracle. Yeah. It might come to that 1%, but it ain't coming to most of us. Mm. So you better start getting to work. Yeah. Before we went um, live, if you like, um, you were talking about how your book the audio version's a novel, unique concept. Right. Um, I'd like you to tell everyone you know, where your book is and how they can get it. But can you talk about the concept? Because it, it was the first book I listened to where I thought, this is kind of like radio, kind of like a podcast, yeah. kind of like an interview and kind of like a book all rolled in. And I think that's what you were going for. That's it. it. Yeah. So basically, that's one of the big reasons why I did self-publish, because I was able to put my Goggins twist on everything I did. So with the audio book, it's the first of its kind. And it, Almost everybody, besides my support staff, said, don't do it this way. You need to be the one that reads this, and that's it. No one's ever done it this way. How are we going to do it this way? Mm. Don't do it this way. So basically, in the audio book, there's a bunch of me. I have, I have my, uh, a guy named Adam who's reading it. And through the book, I'm chiming in. And I'm going even deeper, diving in deeper with these different stories. And we're talking off the cuff. And this me and him are talking. So the whole book is read, but through different chapters. And then at the end of each chapter. So you hear me throughout the whole book, mm. giving more content, going deeper, giving the stories that aren't, aren't in the book. And it's just uh, my own little flavor. Mm. And there's tons of stories that are in the audio book that aren't in the real book. Yeah. And I take pride in it because um, basically... No one's ever done it. And right now our book is sitting at, I think, number four. So it's been at number four on the Amazon most sold since December. Wow. And we sold over a million copies and I'm self-published. Mm. So most of it comes from the audio book. We sold over 600 and I think 50,000 copies around there yeah. of the audio book. Because of the, do you think because of the concept? Because of the concept, because, yeah. you know, basically it's so unique and it really draws you in. Yeah. Because I have someone else reading it and I'm in it, but I wanted someone else to read it because you're the hero. Yeah. This isn't, I'm not the hero of this book. It may be about me, but I'm really talking to you. I want you to be thinking about your personal life. And that's how we do. We draw the listener in to this story yeah. and make you say, oh shit, man. Like, okay, I'm in it now. I'm, I'm, I'm living this story now with this guy. Mm. So, but the fact that you're in it, I think, is also really important. Yes. Because people, like, it's hard to get across how you're like and your intensity and your passion with a voiceover artist, you know, yes, someone else hearing, hearing you. Cause right. You, like, some of the things you've said on this interview, I'm like, oh, that'd be a great time to finish the podcast, but I want to get the questions in. Right. But it's the way you said it, not just what you said. Right. Yeah, I, I have a different delivery, um, which is why I had to find... Everything about me is very unique. Mm. And that's what I want people to realize. We're all unique in our own right. Yeah. You can't be muffled. You can't be muffled by these different voices in your head or these different people who doubt you, whatever. So it took me a long time to find my voice. Therefore, I know what you're saying. That's why I had to be mm. on the audio book. Yeah. And how I write and how I speak is very different. So, but it's very primitive. I don't overthink anything. Yeah. All of my takeaways in the book, and there's tons of them in the book, they're all very basic takeaways. Mm. They're things that you can apply immediately to your life. And I'm not trying to sell you on it. I don't give a shit if you buy it or not. But they're very quick. And that's how my mind works. I, I'm, I'm, I'm simple stupid. Yeah. Keep it simple stupid, man. 
And that's how life is. We overthink things. Mm. And, be, and next thing you know, this very simple thing, screw the light bulb in. Becomes very hard. Yeah. Just screw the fucker in, man. <laughs> yeah. No, no, just screw the fucker in. That's yeah. it. You're done. Yeah. And that's how my life is now. Mm. Just screw the fucking light bulb in, man. Let's go. Yeah. Great. And uh, this podcast um, is really about disruptors, disruptive people. Um, what does that word disruptive mean to you? I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is just what you said, disruptive people. For the majority of my life, people disrupted my life, but I allowed them to. Mm. But what happens is over a period of time, you become the disturbance mm. in your life because you allow all these disturbances to get in your head. Therefore, you have all this shit going on, but you become your biggest bully. Yeah. And once that happens, it's over. Mm. Once that happens, it's over because all you have in your mind on literally on a loop is negative self-talk. Yeah. And once that negative self-talk is on a loop, it's hard to get out of it. Mm. Someone once said to me, um, the, 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 best thing, the best way to disrupt is to disrupt yourself before someone else does competitions, friends, whatever. Do you have a thought on that about you taking control of challenging yourself so someone else doesn't own your life? That's the whole thing I talk about, winning the battle in the morning. So every morning I wake up, I believe in winning the battle against yourself. People say, why do you say that? Because there's a lot of things you can control. When you wake up, I talk about making your bed. Make your bed, make sure your house is clean, make sure you get your breakfast, make sure you shower, shave, whatever you're doing, control that. Don't hit the snooze button. All these things are very important. That's been told a lot of times. Why don't you hit the snooze button? Because you wake up already failing. You're already mm -hmm. behind the power curve. So what happens when you hit the snooze button? You may not make your bed. You may not do your hair the way you want it. You may not pick the right clothes out in the morning time. And I go back to this real quick. Remember how you had a job interview for a job? We've had several of them in our lives. What did you do the night before that job, weeks before the job interview, when you knew you had it? You prepared your, you know, you had a bowl out for your oatmeal, your cereal, whatever you had in the morning time. Your coffee cup was out. Your clothes were laid out. You studied, you rehearsed, you were ready. You brought your best self. Mm. You were going to war with yourself because you wanted that interviewer to see your best self. You won. You got the job. After a few months in that job, you look around, hmm, I got the job. Start to back off, the clothes aren't out. You're not ready, you're hitting the snooze button. You don't get up on time anymore. You realize that you can still have this job and not be your best self. The interview you is gone. Your job is gone. You have your job, but the interview you is gone. So winning the battle in the morning time is just that is that you wake up in the morning time and you own all this stuff because once you leave your house, the world then gets at you. And that's why I believe in not, not, not getting up in the morning time and checking your phone immediately. Everybody does that. They get up, the first thing they do is grab their phone, look at the phone. Maybe bad news on there. Mm. So how's your day start off? I don't go to the gym. I don't make my bed. I don't, you're caught up now on that phone. That's how your day starts. You lost control. So once you win that, once you win that battle in the morning time, then once you go out, now you've won. You go outside your house, you may lose your job. You may have a bad hit, but you won something. So, you, so you're going into battle having already won something, having already won. So then if you hit the snooze button, you go out, you're just defeated already. You're behind the power curve. Now you've won something. You feel better about yourself. Mm. So now you're able to take these hits along the way. Yeah. So that's the mindset that I think it's important to bring with you every day you go, mm. everywhere you go in life. Love Win it. what you can. Mm. And that is a good way to end the podcast. Uh, just to finish, where can people follow you? Where would you like to send people? So I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter. It's just at David Goggins. Yeah. Um, the book I self-published, obviously. Um, Can't Hurt Me. Can't Hurt Me is yeah. the book title. And it's on Amazon, it's on Audible. Yeah. Um, those are only two spots, right? Amazon, Audible. ITunes, you, yeah, yeah, iTunes. Yeah. But for the most part, um, you know, but but the audio book is definitely the one I yeah. would definitely recommend. Yeah. David, uh, for your time, thank you very much. Very grateful. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.